Now on BBC Two, the new Jerusalem charts the political and human upheavals that followed the creation of the welfare state's jewel in the crown. In July 1945, the British people voted in a Labour government with an impregnable majority of 146. To Tory outrage, the victors flaunted their newfound power with a hearty rendering of the red flag in the Commons chamber. Across London, in their grand headquarters in Tavistock Square, the British Medical Association was meeting. News of the Labour landslide was received with gloom and trepidation, but there was some small consolation. William Beveridge, civil servant turned Liberal MP and architect of a plan for a free National Health Service, had lost his seat. A cheer went up from the delegates. Exactly three years later, in the face of concerted opposition from GPs, hospital consultants and the Conservative Party, the world's first free universal health service began. The National Health Service was implemented on the 5th of July 1948, a very memorable day. And we had a big, big party and we had a bonfire and the receipt books which had to be um, completed when patients paid their half crown were burnt on the bonfire. We just had a lovely celebration. It was marvellous not to have to collect money from people. We were able to give our whole attention to patient care and not worry about money. The promise of the new National Health Service was to provide free and equal medical treatment for anyone who needed it. Over the next half century, the service would face challenges its founders could barely imagine. But in 1945, with the election over, the challenge was getting the project off the ground at all. Marshalling the opposition was the British Medical Association. The BMA at that time was a very reactionary organisation and they went on and on about how precious the doctor-patient relationship was and how this would be destroyed by the National Health Service and of course the truth was the exact opposite. Uh, nothing destroyed doctor-patient relationships like having to pay money or failing to pay money. The BMA mounted a public campaign against the proposed new service led by its secretary Charles Hill, the radio doctor. We all want better health services and better health. But in organizing them, let's make sure that your doctor doesn't become the state's doctor. Nye Bevan, the new Minister of Health, did not seem to be intimidated by the patricians of the BMA. One of the doctors said something at which Nye bridled. Shot him down. And the chairman of the doctors, uh, Dr. Guy Dane, got up in protest. Minister, he said, what you said to my colleague is nothing but clever misrepresentation. And I leant across the table and said, Doctor, he said, it couldn't have been so clever for you to have spotted it so quickly. Top of Bevan's list were the hospital consultants. He had already announced the nationalisation of all the hospitals, and they suspected that they were next for state control. They saw Bevan's plans as a threat to their independence and to their private practices. Bevan knew their cooperation was crucial to his plans. He offered a compromise. Bevan did a deal right at the beginning um, in Prunier's restaurant, I think, in St. James's Street, over dinner with the president of the Royal College of Physicians. And the president got what he wanted, these extra payments then called distinction awards for, for specialists and the right to have uh, private beds in National Health Service hospitals. And um, I remember I went to dinner with Bevan, and he came out with that famous phrase, 
he said, I stuff their mouths with gold. <laughs> and of course, he hadn't any gold left to give the GPs. Ah, <laughs> oh, come in. At the time, GPs' income came from charging patients every time they were treated. Working men had their fees paid by an insurance scheme known as the panel. But women, children, old people, the middle classes, all had to pay themselves. Not surprisingly, Bevan's plan was popular with rich and poor alike. But many GPs were profoundly suspicious. They thought that they would be forced to become salaried civil servants. The BMA proposed a boycott. It's obviously quite a job sending out the BMA plebiscite to 56,000 doctors asking them, roughly speaking, whether they approve of Mr. Bevan's scheme. They didn't. They voted for a boycott, but they didn't have the consultant's clout. For them, Bevan used the stick, not the carrot. Have you chosen your family doctor? A government campaign actively encouraged people to sign up with the first few NHS doctors. The response was so good that resistance crumbled, and most GPs grudgingly signed up. Now don't forget, Choose your doctor now. On July 5th, the new National Health Service starts providing hospital and specialist services, medicines, drugs and appliances, care of the teeth and eyes, and maternity services. The new service was an instant success. Immediately it made medical care available to women who hadn't had it before and to children. Inevitably, as more patients were being treated and more staff being taken on, the cost rose sharply. And one reason why it seemed to rise so sharply was that the accounts of many of the hospitals on which the estimates had had to be based were sketchy in the extreme. I knew one small hospital where uh, uh, I was told by the chairman that the only accounts they had were the stubs of a checkbook. But it was the unexpected demand for spectacles and dentistry that was to provoke the first NHS political crisis. The nation had suddenly discovered their eyes and teeth. For teeth and wigs and specs, you needn't send your checks. Now we've decided that they're all provided free. Your specs and teeth and wigs, the syrup of your figs, will come your way without the payment of a fee. The patient had a set of full dentures fitted probably 20 years before had never been given any instructions about taking them out. And when you examined her, all you could see was this great foaming, purpley red mass of gum, stippled with bleeding spots. When you folded the gum back, underneath it was a full lower engine that had been totally grown over. My grandfather used to get his, his, his glasses from Woolworths. They were sixpence a pair, I think. <laughs> he never had, a, never had an examination in his life. Well, of course, he could go for optical test and had proper glasses. Same as the teeth. If you'd like to try this one on, it'll give you some idea. Within two years, the unexpected cost of all this forced Gate School to introduce the first ever NHS charges. For Bevan, this was a betrayal. <laughs> The resignation of Mr. Bevan as a result of his opposition to the charges on dentures and spectacles poses all sorts of political possibilities. With his wife it wasn't long before the whole Labour government were out of office. The incoming Conservative government had grave doubts about the hungry infant Bevan had dumped in their lap. The Health Minister, Ian MacLeod, set up a special committee to look after the cost of the NHS. The expectation was that it would reveal the NHS to be profligate. On the committee was a young economist, Brian Abel Smith. What we found out was that the proportion of national resources going on the health service was going down, not up. And that was a bit of a hit for the government. The Gillibo report, as it was called, demonstrated the NHS was not only doing a better job than the pre-war system, it was also better value for money. There are reports of Conservative MPs on the backbench Conservative uh, Committee on Health saying, we've had it. I mean, this has scuppered us. We're not going to be able to put the clock back and change the health service back to what it was before the war. And they were furious, absolutely furious. And it meant that the Treasury ended up not cutting money on the health service, but actually having to spend more. 
You're just too wonderful I'll never find the word The National Health Service had arrived. Opposition was effectively over. Thus began a long period of consensus. From now on, disagreement was to be about means, not ends. I'll never find the words that tell enough. For doctors, the 50s were a period of spectacular success. Scarlet fever, TB, diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, pneumonia, polio. All fell before the miracle of modern medicine. Doctors who previously were seen as people could only write a prescription for some cough medicine suddenly wrote a prescription for something that actually saved your life. The act of writing the prescription wasn't any more skilled in the second instance than in the first, but the effect was quite different. So doctors took a huge leap forward to becoming much, much, much more credible than parsons and priests as emissaries of God. My mother was in awe of the doctor. There was a hushed silence when he entered the house. And she used to stand dutifully with her hands folded and would never speak a word. She wouldn't ask a question. It was whatever he said was law. It would be, yes, doctor, no, doctor. There was a hushed silence, you know. Reverence, absolute reverence to the doctor. Television was getting right inside the hospitals to see the doctor's skills at their most dramatic. Most babies, like this one, who cry as soon as they're born, but a few don't. This one hasn't. The clock is started at the moment of birth. The baby is limp and pale and its heart is beating slowly, all signs that it needs oxygen urgently. Now the oxygen is being attached to the tube and the baby's lungs are being inflated with oxygen. Now listen to the baby's heart. almost normal now. The baby's colour is better. Oxygen is still being given because the baby isn't fully revived and it hasn't moved yet. Now it's moving its legs and its arms. It'll be quite safe to remove the tube now. And there's the first cry, a most welcome sign. The emergency is over now. This baby's life has been saved. Prospective mothers no longer needed to pay to enjoy reassurance like this. And the demand for hospital birth soared. But social attitudes weren't as modern as the medicine. The ward sister didn't want the married mothers to be mixing with the unmarried mothers. So she had the ward was separated by a partition. And in the back ward were all the unmarried mothers. One husband said, I want to visit Mrs. Smith. And the ward sister said to him, all right, he's in that bed. Are you Mr. Smith? He said, no, I'm not Mr. Smith, but I'm the father of her baby. And immediately that woman was moved from the front ward to the back ward. And she became Miss Smith after that. Death in childbirth, which in the mid-30s was claiming the lives of nearly 500 women in every 100,000 births had dropped to less than 40 by 1960. Infant mortality fell by two-thirds. The NHS was delivering, and even the doctors were firmly on board. This National Health Service is fantastic. I think it's the greatest thing that ever happened. Amid the retreat from empire, the NHS had become an institution of which all Britons were proud. But it was struggling to cope with its pre-war stock of crumbling hospitals. It was a mark of how things had changed that the next Minister of Health, the right-wing Enoch Powell, commissioned a massive building plan for new hospitals to match the enormous sums spent on new schools and council houses. I remember talking to Enoch about our need to have more 
capital because we'd had far too little capital in the 50s. And he took that up at once and said, I'll have them produce a national plan, and that's what will convince Parliament of what we need to do. And that's what he did, and that was the 1962 power plan. And what a plan. It called for the construction of 90 brand new hospitals from scratch and the total overhaul of 134 others. When Labour returned to power in 1964, they were right behind Powell's plan. A man recently appointed to advise the Minister on the development of the health service is Brian Abel Smith. Well, at the moment we're spending £73 million a year uh, on hospital capital construction. Now, the trouble is that half this amount is needed just to keep pace with the growing population. That means we've only got the other half um, to uh, rebuild the hospitals. The need for new hospitals was only too visible. Hammersmith was an old Victorian workhouse converted into a hospital, but they did lots of high-tech stuff there. Graham Frew was about to receive a new kidney in an operation which in those days was risky and experimental. They got in touch with my twin sister and asked her if she'd give me a kidney. The transplant was going to be done on a Sunday um, because the, they had two theatres spare which meant she could go in one and her kidney could come across to me in the other one. At the time, it was raining. The theatres in Hammersmith were over like a, a courtyard. It got me down for stairs. There was an umbrella over the top of me. Today, Graham Frew is the longest surviving kidney transplant patient in the UK. Even in those days, there were mutterings about the expense of such revolutionary new techniques. I had heard before that, um, because there weren't so many, very many successes, that um, it was thought they were far too expensive to carry on. The money could be better spent on other things. But with triumphs like this, quibbles about money seemed churlish. Consultants were lords of all they surveyed well-paid, well-respected, and equipped with the best technology they could now look forward to a rosy future in gleaming new hospitals. For the GPs, though, it was an entirely different story. When I became minister, it was very clear where my first priority lay. Um, general practice was in a state of absolute turmoil. We turn to something else. Doctors. At last week's meeting of the British Medical Association said that the National Health Service is heading for breakdown. Angry delegates spoke of lack of money, lack of doctors, bad organisation. If a doctor spends a lot of money on providing facilities for his patients in his practice, he gets exactly the same allowance for expenses as a doctor who spends hardly any money in providing facilities for his patients. Tories were all When Labour took over in 1964, Kenneth Robinson had pleased the public by abolishing prescription charges. But the GPs were close to revolt. General practice was looked down on by the medical profession as the sort of bottom end of medicine. Morale was extremely low. They were paid poorly compared with hospital doctors. And the crux came very shortly after I took over, when the review body on doctors' remuneration recommended a nil settlement. And that caused the detonation. The British Medical Association had persuaded a very large percentage of doctors to sign resignation notices undated, but a sword of Damocles over the head of any minister. The resignations poured in, 18,000 in three weeks. It was a dispute over conditions as much as pay, and negotiations dragged on. Eventually, compromise was reached. When the agreement on conditions was handed back to the pay review body, they had a change of heart. Now they recommended a whacking 30% pay rise. It surprised me how generously they priced it. And so the uh, profession were quite happy to accept. Start going back into the shop on uh, Monday. Well, it made a tremendous difference to me because I had 
really made a very, very poor living indeed because I felt I had to be properly equipped and had to have proper staff and I had to pay all of that out of my earnings. Uh, and suddenly this began to be paid for properly, so it, it was wonderful. But finding the money was not that easy. Soon afterwards, Wilson devalued the pound and government spending had to be cut back. Either hospital building stopped or prescriptions had to be paid for again. In a fortnight's time, on Monday the 10th of June, prescription charges are being reintroduced at the rate of half a crown an item. It was a clear demonstration that even health had a price tag. But now, another storm broke around Robinson. Since the beginning of the NHS, there had been worries about conditions in mental hospitals. Bevan, Powell and Robinson himself had all expressed concern about mental health. But somehow, the money and attention always went elsewhere. In 1968, the issue finally made headlines when one formidable Hampstead woman took on the state virtually single-handedly. Well, there was an incredible lady who'd never done anything in her life except ballet dancing called Barbara Robb. And she went to visit an old retainer of the family and for the first time saw what it was like, and absolutely shocked. You know, teeth were taken away, you know, she was incoherent and so on. So she started a campaign. I never saw Miss Wills in any condition that could conceivably necessitate her entering a mental hospital. In the first place, she was absolutely petrified because just one member of the staff hit her when she was incontinent. Of course, Miss Wills had absolutely no control over this. It mortified her and humiliated her, the fact that she was incontinent, and this was enough without the fact that she might be hit if she was found to have had an accident. I've seen quite a few cases of beatings. Elderly patients thrown onto the floor and kicked. Stripped and left in the cold. Brutality was widespread. On the first day of my admission, there was um, a very tall nurse, maybe 24-ish. And this nurse, he looked after me, which meant two things. On one hand, I would be shaved every morning and I'd have to have a bath before breakfast. On the other hand, if he was angry, he would uh, punch me in the stomach or he would beat me with towels or he would kick me. You know, he told me about a unique thing called number nine boot therapy and he said, Smiler, I'm going to give you number nine boot therapy and he kicked me down two flights of concrete stairs. Barbara Robb's campaign published a book detailing abuse in institutions across the country. Looking after mental patients is a very, very unrewarding occupation. And I think I felt it obligatory to spring the, to the defense of those who are looking after the patients. And maybe I overdid it, I don't know. Under media pressure, Robinson agreed to set up an inquiry into conditions in mental homes. But the report was heavily edited before publication. Well, of course, Barbara Robb was saying that this is all whitewash. And, of course, the press tended to side with Barbara Robb after she was a sensational character, really. I think it was a terrible mistake in political judgment to allow, presumably, the department to edit those reports and not publish them in full. It was an issue which wouldn't go away. When Dick Crossman took over as health minister, he was appalled by conditions in asylums. Following allegations of brutality at Ely Hospital in Cardiff, another inquiry was set up. The details were the same as most of the others, and including possibly that a patient had been beaten up and killed by nursing staff. And uh, that was inquired into by another QC, who happened to be Geoffrey Howe. And he did a much more thorough report than the previous ones had been done and did expose the problem. And then, of course, the question presented itself to Crossman, should I allow the department to edit it, which it was already doing, of course, and whitewashing it. Crossman's reaction was to bypass his civil servants. He briefed the newspapers. He phoned up newspapers and said, I've got an exclusive for you. I'm prepared to talk on the record about this scandal. Uh, and he actually helped to drum up um, public concern about the issue, which, of course, brought pressure on him, extracted more money from the Treasury, and uh, pushed ahead with a programme of 
development of, of the uh, new services for the mentally handicapped. The public concern these scandals generated would mean in time the closure of most of the old Victorian asylums. Although the new idea of looking after patients outside hospitals was to suffer the same shortage of money as the old system. By the time Keith Joseph became health minister in 1970, the NHS was becoming a victim of its own success. Waiting lists were lengthening and costs rising. An aging population meant caring for more old people and many more treatments were now available. Joseph decided a complete reorganization of the management was the answer. What we built into the management is something quite unfamiliar to business. It's called consensus management, management by agreement, in which the doctors, the nurses, the administrators, all have to agree on what they recommend. In practice, it meant that nobody agreed about anything. The top-heavy, indecisive monster lumbered into life just as the Tories left office. Hello, girls. Consensus was not part of Barbara Castle's agenda. She planned to overturn Bevan's concession to the consultants, which had allowed them to treat their private patients within NHS hospitals. There was a growing demand for the phasing of pay beds out of NHS hospitals. And I'd inherited that. It was in our manifesto that we would do it. And, of course, it meant taking on that most powerful body of men, uh, the consultants, who were, uh, I must say, a very arrogant lot in those days. She often reminded me of the first Queen Elizabeth. I mean, she had a certain look of her and a similar sort of determination. And I was wondering, you know, did they really represent a group of sort of Spanish grandees who would have planned the Spanish Armada? But they were a tough lot. Um, Tony Grabham could be very aggressive across the table. And she was good, good at hitting back. Here was a woman who was going to show uh, the Labour Party that something could be done about this fundamental issue. Uh, she did it with great charm, but not with enormous skill. The lengthening waiting lists made pay beds a hot issue. Unofficial action by ancillary workers at Charing Cross Hospital, led by a shop steward known to all as Mar Brookstone, brought the issue centre stage. The Charing Cross Hospital did bring things to a head. There was Mar Brookstone, a very formidable woman. The department you know, were terrified of her. They thought she was a sort of, you know, she-devil incarnate. Um, she comes along saying something with which I had every sympathy, namely, uh, that uh, they weren't, you know, they were fed up. From midnight tonight, there will be no private wards in this hospital as far as we are concerned. Uh, it's up to the management to keep these going if they think this is possible. We were having to pay for pay beds. No money came back to the hospital. That the catering officer was having to use health service money to provide these extra diets and things to the 15th floor, to people who were paying, but who paid their money went to the regional board. Nothing came back to compensate the hospital. So we said, that's it, we don't want them, out. The battle lines were drawn, with Castle and the unions on one side, the consultants and the BMA on the other. We had to display uh, to the public and to Parliament a situation which seemed to be grossly unfair to these respected doctors. Would doctors contemplate in industrial action unless the government was doing something terrible? And then we had to paint uh, the picture of, on one side, the respected, well-loved consultant, and on the other side, the troublemaking politician. What complicated the picture was that the nurses chose this moment to strike over pay. Will the rest of you please promise me to go home and get dry? Because you're quite right, where would we be without you? So God bless and please go home, I've got your point. Bye. By now, the NHS was slipping into chaos. 
Striking nurses were joined by junior doctors working to rule over long hours. GPs collected 16,000 resignations to push their pay award. Then the consultants added pay to their dispute over pay beds. No doctor wants to go on strike, uh, and most of us do not want to go on strike. But if we are pushed far enough... For 16 weeks, they worked to contract. Just the minimum hours they were paid for. Operations were cancelled, outpatient departments closed, and some patients found themselves anaesthetised but not operated on because time was up. I've known doctors work at the clock at 5 o'clock, walk off, and say, I'm off now, my shift is finished, in the middle of a patient. I agree there were other doctors there, but they have actually walked out of the room. And that's an attitude, what, you wouldn't have seen 10 years ago? I don't think you'd have seen that attitude five years ago. Casa was prepared to settle the nurses and junior doctors, but she could not give ground on her point of principle, pay beds, nor could the consultants. 1,100 consultants and surgeons are crowded in to hear speeches denouncing Mrs. Castle's planned phasing out of pay beds. What the doctors wanted, as their president explained, was less state interference. Interference which has led to a phenomenal increase in administration and which seeks to convert doctors into medical robots at the expense of our patients. Unnerved by the ferocity of the dispute, Harold Wilson intervened. He called on Lord Goodman, solicitor to the stars and confidant of both Labour and Tory Prime Ministers, to mediate between the BMA and Castle. The consultants were paid off, and some of the 4,000 pay beds were axed. But in truth, Castle had lost the battle. Well, I was very angry with Harold. I thought as Prime Minister he should be defending the manifesto commitment. But I suppose they felt economic problems were coming in so thick and fast, they didn't want to be laid, uh, loaded with this one. So, um, you know, they were looking for a little bit of peace somewhere without this dreadful woman insisting on carrying out the party policy. Castle paid the price. She was fired by the new Prime Minister, Jim Callaghan. She had worked hard to improve mental health conditions and to get more money for the regions but her ideological fixation with pay beds led to more, not less, private practice as private hospitals financed by health insurance companies expanded to fill the gap. By now, the health service was costing over 16 billion pounds a year. That represented 4.5% of the nation's gross domestic product. Mrs Thatcher arrived at number 10, determined to cut public spending everywhere. think tanks were exhorted to come up with radical new ideas. The Central Policy Review staff, which was a sort of outfit of civil servants, were asked